Good morning. You guys sound fantastic. Uh, and uh, thank you for singing like you, like you meant it, and it's good to worship with you on a Sunday morning. Well, today we're continuing our series that we've titled Love is the Key, and today I want to talk about loving our kids and love in our home. Next week we'll finish up the series with a, with a message on God's everlasting love for you. But today I want to talk about a question that every kid who's ever lived on planet Earth asks. It's do you love me? Every child who's ever been born wants to know, do you love me as their mother or their father? So I read just this week a news piece on a six-year-old boy in St. Cloud, Florida. His name is Glenn Beretti. Glenn was turning six. He was five, and he's in kindergarten. And so his mother sent out invitations to all 16 kids in his kindergarten class. But the day of his birthday came, it was like a week ago Saturday, and his birthday came, and none of the parents had RSVP'd. His mother knew that morning that none of the kids were coming. And she was heartbroken. She said, maybe it's because my son has autism that none of the 16 kids were coming. So she got on Facebook, and she just kind of spilled her heart, and she said, I'm so sad for my son. He keeps asking, when are my friends coming? And none of them are coming. Well, as soon as she posted it, people started to post back, we're coming to your house. What's your address? We're coming for the birthday party. Because she had already rented a bouncing castle. And, and the first person that showed up was from the St. Cloud Sheriff's Department. I have a picture right here. And he brought him one of those Hulk, uh, Hulk Hogan, not Hulk Hogan, Hulk Knuckles there. And, and so the sheriff showed up. And, and after he left, right after he left, a motorcycle cop showed up. And he let him sit on his motorbike. And then the SWAT team followed. I'm not kidding you. They all came for the birthday. And the SWAT team showed up. And uh, they let him shoot their guns and things like that. And he had <laughs> awesome time with them. Uh, no, but he got to go in the truck. And then as soon as the SWAT team left, the St. Cloud uh, Fire department showed up, and uh, they let him sit in there. They put the hat on him, and then the best part of all is, by the way, we have one last picture of him, is, is the police department, the final thing they did, they sent their helicopter for a flyover. And so his birthday ended with a flyover. More than 40 people showed up for Glenn's birthday in St. Cloud, Florida, because his mother knew that every kid wants to know that somebody loves me. So Jesus knew this too. We see this in, in an incident in Mark chapter 10. So open your Bibles there. And I have this key idea on the screen. I want you to look. It's in your handout, and I have it on the screen as well. And it's this. Above all else, the deepest longing of every child is to know that they are loved, unconditionally loved, because all children ask this same basic question, do you love me? All right, so in, in Mark chapter 10, we read this, verse 13. People were bringing their little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who cannot receive the kingdom of God like a, a little child will never enter it, verse 16. And then he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. And so Jesus knew that every child wants to know that somebody loves them. And today, I, I want to start with this premise. I want to, to give you a challenge today. And the challenge is, is to fill your home with unconditional love. That if you're going to fill it with anything, the most basic and fundamental thing you must fill it with is love, unconditional love. Now, what does is, what is unconditional love mean? mean? First of all, it means that it's love without limits. It's love without expectations. It's love regardless, regardless, or no matter what they are doing. Uh, unconditional love isn't earned. Uh, unconditional love is when you love someone no matter how they are behaving, no matter what they're doing, no matter what they're saying. And it's the fundamental thing to everything that Jesus talks about in, for our homes. 
And so I, I want to share with you a thought, and I invite you to take it home because it will become life-changing, I believe, for your, for your homes. And so I've written this down. So I want you to repeat these words after me, if you will, for your kids. If you don't have kids, then this is just for your neighbor kids. All right, so we'll do that. And it's this. Um, I will love my child. Well, let me start out. So you're going to say this after me. I will love my child. No matter what. Every day. Regardless of how they behave. I will love my child every day. Well, you don't have to repeat it again, but some of you can. Um, every day. No matter what they do, it doesn't matter at all. Sometimes we send the message that love is earned. That sometimes we send the message that we only love our kids when they behave a certain way, but unconditional love isn't like that. Unconditional love isn't earned. Unconditional love is love that you show no matter how many goals they score. Unconditional love doesn't take a certain grade. Unconditional love isn't whether they make the team or not. Unconditional love isn't even conditioned on their behavior. Unconditional love is no matter what. And so I want to start with, I have this on the screen. Every child is saying, love me, aren't they? Every child has this basic need to know that somebody loves them. Now, here's the thing with the love that we're talking about today is that love, if you think about it, is a very abstract idea. You can't touch love. A kid, a five-year-old can't play with love like he can a train or hold it like a stuffed animal. Love is an abstract concept. And so kids don't always understand love, especially if we just say it. Now, if you say, I love you to an 18-year-old, they get it. But little children are concrete thinkers. They have to have something tangible that represents the ideas that you're talking about. And so love has to be shown to them. And, and in spite of it's something that that they are concrete thinkers in. Every child has a love capacity. Every child has like a tank in their soul. And your child will not perform at their best or do their best or be at their best until that love tank is filled. And so I want to talk this morning about different ways that we fill this, this need for love in our children because it goes far beyond just saying the words, I love you. I think the first thing that every child is asking is, do you see me? Because if you really see someone, then you, you love them. Here's what Jesus says. So Jesus was good at seeing. Jesus was good at noticing. And so as we talk about how to fill our homes with unconditional love, go back to Mark 10, verse 14, and we read this. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. So they were stopping the children from coming. And he said, let the children come to me. So Jesus notices, Jesus sees that his disciples are stopping the kids from coming to him. And I want you to get that Jesus noticed. Jesus paid attention and Jesus saw like nobody else. I have kind of a, a definition here of attention, that when you pay attention to someone is taking notice of someone and regarding that person as interesting and important. Do you see how that is? When you, when you pay attention to someone, and some say it's the most powerful force in the universe to pay attention to someone, but when you pay attention to someone, it's the regarding of them as interesting and important. And don't we all long in our souls to be like that? And I want to say especially kids. So we, have, we had Caitlin Crosby here this last week, and Caitlin did a concert last Sunday night. And afterwards, you know, a bunch of people came and met her in the lobby and bought her CDs, and a father was, that I saw the next morning said, Caitlin was incredible, wasn't she? I said, yes, I loved her music. He said, no, I'm talking about she was incredible with the kids. He said, my daughter came up, and Caitlin started asking her questions like, what's your favorite flower? You know, what's your favorite color? And where do you go to school? And he said, she treated her like she was so special, like she was the only person in the world. And then they took a picture together. He said... Caitlin made my daughter feel like she was a princess. And he said, so as we're walking back to the car, his daughter said, Dad, I feel so happy. And isn't that how we all feel if someone pays attention? And then she says, Dad, I feel like doing a cartwheel. And that's what she said. And so he said, well, then do a cartwheel. And she started doing cartwheels on the way to the car because 
Someone paid attention. Someone noticed. Someone saw her. And I say all of that to, to only to point out that all of our kids are asking us, do you see me? Do I matter? And if you aren't paying attention to your kids, then as they get older, they start looking for that aff- affirmation on Facebook and Twitter. When they turn uh, five or six years old, they open Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts, and they're looking for likes and affirmation there when really they just want it from you. Newsweek magazine had an article titled, and I just have a piece from it here, titled The Myth of Quality Time, and they write, Kids Don't Do Meetings. You can't raise them in short, scheduled bursts. They need lots of attention. Quality time has become a way of deluding ourselves into short-changing our children. It's an illusion to think that they are going to be on your timetable and that you can say, okay, we've got half an hour. Let's get on with it. You can't do that. They need lots of attention. They need your focused attention. Behavior psychologists say that children, babies, from a very early age, um, from a very early age, they notice that when people see their faces. They know when someone is looking at them. They know that there's a face that matters, even from the crib in the nursery. They'll, they'll, They'll notice that when they cry, if they're hungry, this face that they see, they can be in tune with this person will actually solve that hunger problem. And and if their diaper needs changing, they just have to scowl and frown, and the diaper gets changed. And they know that if they look at that face, good things happen. Have you ever noticed, though, that if you play peekaboo with a small baby, they get, you know, you put something in front of your face, they think you're gone, you've died. And they get all worked up, and they start to cry. And then you, you move it, and they get excited. You're back, and you're alive, and they're just so thrilled that you didn't leave. Why is that? Because they're in tune with your face. They know when your face is looking at them. A baby cannot survive without the mother's face or even the father's face. Uh, The face is what tells them that they matter. And my point is, is that when you give attention, pay attention to to your sons and daughters, you're saying, I love you. So I said kids cry out to be loved, and one of the ways they do it is by saying, see me. They also say, cheer me. They say that. So let's go back to verse 14 in Mark chapter 10, and we read, Jesus saw this. He saw that they were stopping the kids, and he says, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus is saying, these are the rock stars in the kingdom of God. These are the most important people in the kingdom of God. And so he cheers the children. He says they matter most. And isn't it true that every child wants to know that you affirm them, they want to be encouraged, they want to be championed and built up and told that they're the best. They need to hear that and they need to hear that from you. When my sons were growing up, when Veronica and I, especially when we were younger parents, I remember we would start telling our kids when they were like three or four years old what career they were prepared for. We thought that was important. I remember my oldest son, he was just like four years old, five, maybe, not even five, but the kid had never met a stranger. He always had a smile on his face, and so we started telling him, you're going to be a youth pastor. That's what you're going to do, because he loved to have fun, and we said, and we'd tell him, you're going to be a pastor one day. And then our other son came along, and he was very serious and analytical, and his room was very organized. We'd say, we'd say you're going to be a doctor. You know, we see that in you. You're going to be a doctor. Our other son came along, and by six, seven years old, he would beat anyone in the family at Monopoly. And, and so we said, you're going to be a stockbroker or a banker, and we'd tell him that. And then so we're sitting at the dinner table one night. By the way, I don't know why young parents think they can already at age five tell their, their kids what they're going to be, but we thought that would help. So we're sitting at dinner, and, and the, the one who we said was going to be a doctor, he's sitting there, and, and he had heard us say this a dozen times or more, and he says, Dad, I know now what I'm going to be when I grow up. I said, really? He's five. And I said, really? You have it figured out? He said, yes. He said, Dad, I'm going to be a New York City taxi driver. <laughs> That's what he said. And I was like, what did I do to make him aspire to that? Of all the things, he wants to be a New York City taxi driver. It was a fail. But my point is, 
our kids want to know that you prize them and, you, and, and that they're important. And so cheer them. Maybe some of you have a fridge door. Ours has always been the wall of fame on our refrigerator door. And certificates go up there. And, and grades, uh, the best grades go up there. And, and, and all the pictures, you know, their class pictures, all of those things go on the fridge door. And it's just a small statement that you value them and you prize them and you cheer them. My point is, is that children um, really thrive on a parent's building up and encouragement. I would say conversely, our, our cutting words uh, have the opposite effect. Our, our cutting words, your children will remember for a lifetime. Be, be very careful what you say. Uh, they're waiting for someone to say certain things to them. I found this a while ago and held on to it. I don't know for what class and what grade this is from, but some teacher had one of our kids write down things that they valued or they thought about themselves. And uh, he wrote, I am strong, I am fun, I am handsome, <laughs> and he is, I am thankful, I am kind, I am a leader, I am smart, I am creative, I am loved. So the thing is, we can only write so much about ourselves. What they long for most is to hear those words from you. And so cheer your sons and daughter. Become, become that person for them. They love to hear words like, I'm proud of you. Some parents will say, of all the boys and girls in the world, we are so lucky that God put you in our family. Cheer them. I'll say next, when kids sense the, are, are, are crying out on the inside to be loved, they'll say this. They'll say, hold me. Every child wants to be helped. The thing is, you know, I, humans survive on, hu, on, on the touch of others. We need that to be healthy people. But the problem is when I was younger, there was a contagion, a disease that was going around. It was far more contagious than the measles you're hearing about in Disneyland. It could have been more dangerous and contagious even than Ebola. It was that contagious. Just the mere mention of it to my friends that someone who carried it was coming, they would run and they would hide. The good news is you could always spot from a mile away the person who was carrying this disease. It was always a girl. That's, that's what it was. It's called cooties. Maybe you've heard of this. And cooties, all they had to do was look at you, let alone touch you. And, and in second grade, they would run around with this disease at recess trying to, to pass it on to the guys. But we were faster and try to get out of there. Fortunately, little boys outgrow that. And when you, you know, if you have sons, when they get to be 13 years old, they figure out that it's a good thing when girls try to hold their hand or something like that. But every, every person who's lived on planet Earth wants to be held by someone because when you hold them, it says, I love you. Jesus knew that. And so we read this. People were bringing their children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. Move down to verse 16. This is after he corrected the situation. He took the children in his arms. Can you see that picture in your mind? And he placed his hands on them. And he blessed them. Jesus was very good at touching people that need to be loved. Wasn't he? There was the little girl that he said, Talitha Kahum, and he took her by the hand and he held her hand and she lived. There was Peter who was drowning and he grabs onto his hand and he holds him and he lives. Uh, there's the leper who, who was a curse and he took his hand and he holds him and he's healed. There's Thomas who comes to me and he says, can I, can, and Jesus says, if you really want to believe that I'm not just a spirit, then touch the hole in my hands and he touches Jesus' hand. Uh, Gary Smalley and John Trent, they cite, ex uh, cite extensive research that talks about how uh, there's a difference, a great difference in homes of people who hug and embrace each other and, and who will hold on to each other often, and, and then the homes where there is no touching and no hugging. He said, in the homes where husband and wife or even the children are hugged often and held on to, without exception, those families tend to live much longer than in the families where there's no touch. My point is, is that the human soul needs and thrives on 
being held on to. And so every son and daughter that you have, they long for someone to hold their hand or to be held at night when you read something or to be hugged when they come home from school or before they go to bed. If you have boys, they love to wrestle. And, and fathers, it's okay to pin them or put them in a chokehold. They love all of that. And uh, they just want to know you're strong. And, uh, but your children are waiting for you to hold them because when you hold your child, it says, I love you. The final thing I'll say this morning is that every child on the inside is crying, and when they cry out to be loved, they're saying, lead me. I want you to turn back in the Bibles, in your Bibles, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And you know the passage well, but so I'm going to read it from the Living Bible because it reads just a little different and maybe, maybe a little interesting, and it reads like this. These commands that I've given you today are to be upon your hearts. Get them inside of you. And then get them inside of your children. I like that. Talk about them whenever you are sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from time to time and get up in the morning till when you, when you uh, fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorpost of your home. Can I say fathers and mothers, one of your great roles is to lead your children, lead your family toward God. It's one of your great responsibilities. I am afraid if I ask the question, how are you doing it leading your family spiritually and toward God, there are probably a number of fathers and mothers who know they are not doing the best they can. And so my challenge this morning is to lead your family spiritually. Uh, lead them in showing courage and generosity. Lead them in showing them a life that matters Lead them to pray together. Lead them to read the Bible and study together. Lead them in coming to worship together. Some of you that have junior hires or high schoolers will try to argue you into coming to church without them. Don't let them do that because you need to come and worship together. Every month we have opportunities to serve. Come and serve together as a family with your sons and with your daughters. But one of the great roles you have in every child wants to know that you are leading their family, your family spiritually. So I'll end with that challenge.